And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a story about a man whose name was synonymous with death. We call it The Groom of the Ladder. So now, starring Hans Conried, here is tonight's suspense play, The Groom of the Ladder. Evening, Mr. Price. Evening, William. Oh, it's cold enough. Hard day for you, Mr. Price. Well, I must say I'm fair wore out. Uh, what you need is a bit of the old warming for the cockles. Ah, true, ah, true. Uh, it's cruel work for a man in this weather. Uh, you up down to the blue ball, Mr. Price. Have yourself a dollop. Oh, I thought of that, but I happen to be a little short of fun tonight, William. I wonder... Oh, have one for me, Mr. Price. Oh, that's very nice of you, I must say, William. Very nice. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Mr. Price. My kindest regards to your wife, Mr. Price. Thank you, William. Ooh, what a dirty dog. I hope so give him what for at the blue boar. <laughs> Nasty little rat, that William Hartley. I've got to keep an eye on him. Hartley. What right's he got to look at me like that? I know what he's thinking. Get my job. If a chance of that, I'll see him turned off first. Go, I got a thirst. Uh, should go home, I suppose. Better be grousing out of all neck. Oh, let her grouse. I got me rights. Blue ball for me. Evening, Mr. White, Mrs. White. Mr. Lowe. Oi, Brenny, you're spry as ever. <laughs> Eddie, what's this all about? Somebody dead? <laughs> so that's the way it is, is it? Keep her ale. I said ale. Ale. Perhaps you didn't hear me the first time. Can you pay for it? Yes, I can pay for it. And more. Don't you worry about me. I can pay for anything. You hear that, all of you? I don't need a bloody one of you. You'll all come to me one of these days. Ale. I heard the watchmen are out looking for somebody. He don't pay his debts and he's going to Marshall Sea Prison for it. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Who said it? I wonder who's going to get Jack Tinch's job when he's out of office. <laughs> Who call me that? My name's Price. John Price. John Price. John Price. Hear what I say? John Price. I have such an horrible pain in my throat, Mr. Ketch, dear. Do you have a cure? <laughs> <laughs> Got any old clothes for sale today, Mr. Ketch? <laughs> <laughs> Shut your faces, a lot of you. Stop! I'll do you a mischief, that's what you hear. You, you stop it, man. Turn up. I'll be none of that in here. If you want your ale, come over to the table and drink it. Otherwise, out. Well, uh, I'm sorry I lost my temper. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just very tired tonight. Accept my apologies, keep I don't accept nothing from you except your money. I have to serve you, my charter says so. But no trouble for you. All right, you go. And that's a fact. And don't forget it. Why do they do it? Why, it's always like this. Either they don't say a blinking word or they aim in that awful way. Can't they understand? I'm just like anybody else. I do me job, same as anyone. Gets lonely man sitting by himself, swollen ale, all by himself. 
Wish I had some money. I mean, some of the actual, not coppers. Oh, I'd have friends then. Lots of them. What was it they were saying about the watchmen looking for me? Oh, they can't do that. I'll pay the debts what I owe. If I can only get a good job or two. Why don't they let the man alone? Not fair! <laughs> Not fair. What ain't fair, Mr. Price? Huh? Oh, is it? Oh. Oh, William. William Hartley, huh? You, eh? You got off late tonight, didn't you? That's right, Mr. Price. Ah, having a bit of a guzzle, eh? I will not stand familiarity, William Hartley. Kindly remember your place and station. Oh, no offence oh. intended. None taken, I hopes. Granted. Uh, you mind if I sit down with my mug? I don't mind. Well, dear, long hours, short pay. That's the way of it. William Hartley, why do you talk to me? Why not, Mr. Price? You're my superior, ain't you? In a way, I have to talk to you. I don't want you to have to. I want you to want to. Nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants me. Could be worse, you know. I don't beat my wife or the kid. I try to do what's right. Oh, you're just misunderstood, Mr. Price. Misunderstood. I sympathize. Oh, I want a friend. I want people to smile at me in the streets, talk to me, to like me. Oh, you've got a burden, Mr. Price, and no mistake. Will you? How'd you like to lend me five sovereigns? I could pay you back with interest. I, I got one or two odd debts to pay you. Well, I heard about that, Mr. Price. Harry White was... Harry paying... White, what's he now? He's after me job. Just like you, William Hartley. Uh, you don't pull the wool over my eyes. I know, I know. How could you think such a thing, Mr. Price? Why, you remember this. I'm not out of office yet. Remember, you stay nice to me, William, because I have a position... Now, uh, how about a couple of sovereigns? I know you got it, so there's no use to know. Well, I'd like to oblige Mr. Price to help me. I would, but my wife's expecting again. And you know how it is with another mouth to feed. How about a copper's worth of ale, then? Huh? You know, I was going to buy one for you, Mr. Price, but when I reached into my pocket, I found I had just enough for my own mug. Where you might be. You are a dirty, sneaking little liar. Mr. Price. Don't you ever find yourself in trouble. Because if you do, it's John Price who's going to be there taking loving care of you. <laughs> oh, Harry, you are a one. Stop it, anyone that thinks of Hello, Mr. White. <laughs> Mrs. White. Oh, good good come on, Elizabeth. Time for us to be going home. All right, Harry. I said hello, that's all. I didn't do no harm, just hello. It's me, John Price, you know me. Can't you say hello? Hello, that's all. William Hartley, he come to the blue ball to laugh at me. That's how he gets his pleasure. They all do. And when I get home, it's going to be the same. Oh, I wish I was dead. John Price, that you? Where you been? I had a piece of mutton on the table at six o'clock. Hello, Beth. Where's the kid? Where you been? I've told you for the last time I ain't oh, going Betty, to... Betty, Betty, love. I had a, a very difficult job today. Like they've broke me poor arm. I swore like a pig. How much did you get? The usual. And it's over? No, bad. Ah, I should have known. You've been boozing at the Blue Bull. Spent every blessed penny. No, I was tired, but I thought a sup would help. Sup? I've said, by the look of you. <sighs> Sweetheart... Well, we got a few shillings put by, haven't we? Oh, no, you don't. No, it's desperate, Beth girl. They'll have me in debtor's prison. I heard them talk tonight. Do you good? No, don't say that. Love, love, it'll only be for a week, two at the most. I got to raise every penny I can. That money's for me and the kid. You don't touch one farthing. I'll lose my job. Don't make me laugh. Your job. Call that a job? I'm ashamed. 
I'm ashamed to have people know me name. I'll bet I'm your husband. It's your duty to obey me. You give me what money we got in the house and I'm going to... Or what? Uh, What'll you do, Jack Ketch? Now, Betty. What'll you do to Mrs. Jack Ketch, you murderer? <coughs> murderer! My husband. What's he do for an honest living? Why, he's a murderer. No, 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 don't. Mother, what does don't daddy do? Don't. He's got a lovely job, Stanley. Don't, don't you, you try you me, Betty. No, your dear old dad turns people off for our bread. Betty. He's Jack Ketch, the public hangman. Betty. Hangman. I'll smash you. smash you. You are listening to The Groom of the Ladder, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. There are twice as many radios in the United States today as there were ten years ago. Every minute of the broadcast day, millions are listening to radio, most of all to CBS Radio which has all of the top 25 daytime programs and eight of the top 10 once-a-week, half-hour evening shows. Yes, leading the way as it goes and grows are the CBS radio shows. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Hans Conried, starring in tonight's production, The Groom of the Ladder, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. I suppose it was wrong to beat her like that. What a man to do. So, what with my debts and what I done to bet, here I am in Marshall Sea Prison. Not the first time I've been here ever. What a stinking hole. All of us together. The muck of London. Men, women, and dogs. There's one lad, though, that ain't so bad. He come in yesterday. He's got learning. A gentleman, you can see that. Thomas Lovelace, his name. He's in debt to his eyes. Two thousand pounds. I'll be here until I rot, Price. Oh, I wouldn't say that, sir. There's always hope. You've been here before? Three times, sir. This is me fourth. I ain't always for debt. Of course, there was the matter of my wife, Betty, this time. What did you do for a living, Price? What's the matter? Hadn't you noticed? The others there, they never talk to me. Hadn't you noticed? Mm, not particularly. Hmm. I'll tell you why. Because I was in the employ of His Majesty. In service to the crown. That's why. That's why they don't talk to you? Well, I suppose you won't either when I tell you. You'll find out in a day or so anyhow. What's the news? I'm... The hangman. Hangman? But I thought that Jack Ketch... That's what they call me. Oh. I thought so. Go on, sir. I won't trouble you. You're a gentleman. You don't want the likes of me. You haven't got a very savory reputation, you know, Price. It was my job. Somebody had to do it. I've heard that you rather enjoyed it. That's a lie. What about the poor devils who paid you to put them out of their misery quickly? I was happy to oblige. Poor souls. Sometimes they give me a few pence to help them through the awful passage to heaven. But, Lord bless them, I did my best. And if they didn't have any money? I wouldn't hold it against them. Of course, I'm not denying that a nice rack or press job was worth a few shillings extra. But wouldn't you have taken the money? I ask you, wouldn't you? I wouldn't have had your job, Price. Not for a million pounds. Oh, well, that's the way of it. Each man to what he knows, right, Mr. Lovelace? My profession is angman. Yours is to be a gentleman. Am I right, sir? And we're both of us in debtor's prison. Well, that gave him something to think about. He wasn't so high and mighty after that. Mr. 
Mr. Lovelace never had visitors. I didn't either. That is, not till one day, three months after I first come here. And it was William Hartley. And I didn't like the nasty weasel smile on him. Well, Price, I heard about your misfortune and I came to sympathise. How thoughtful, William. How do they treat you in here? Treat? Oh, like a blooming earl, can't you see? Nasty smell down here. We haven't brought in the fresh roses yet. No. What about your debts, Price? Any luck? No. It's only a matter of five pounds. William? William Arthur, you did... Did you come here to help me? You're going to lend me the money. Have I misjudged you, William? Good friend. No, you haven't misjudged me, Price. I didn't come here to lend you nothing. I come here like a good Christian to see you had your health and spirits. And I brought you a prayer book for your poor soul to feed on. Oh, blimey! Oh. Change your ways, Price. Change your ways before it's too late. I'll change. I'll change the shape of your head. Oh, I'm going to turn you off proper, Mr. William Hartley. Oh. Let him go! You hear me? Let him go! Get away from him, mate! Stop it! Have you gone mad? You know what they'll do to you with this? The... You shouldn't have done that, Price. I won't forget. You're paying for that. I paid 30 lashes and slum gullion for a month. No, I wasn't going to forget William Hartley. Never in all my life. It was Mr. Lovelace who saved me a crust or two of bread when I was brought up from the black hole. It was the best meal I ever had. And then, things were the same again. The weeks went by. I wrote a song ballad. Mr. Lovelace did the words in writing for me. I called it, The man of destiny's hard fortune, whereby his hopeful harvest is like to be blasted. And nobody bought it, though, though I still didn't have the money to pay me debts. Then I heard about Betty and the kid. They'd run off and left me. And that's when I made up my mind to get out of Marshall Sea. That and William Hartley. Oh, I'd pay a little call on him. I told my idea to Mr. Lovelace one night. <laughs> Mr. Lovelace? Yes? Come closer, sir. Listen, I'm getting out, see? Now, you've treated me right. I'm willing to take you with. How can you? We've got these chains. It's impossible. No, it ain't. They take him off in the afternoon when we exercise, don't they? All right. That's the time. Oh. You leave that to me. You want to go with? I'd rather die trying than stay. All right, sir. Now, here's what we do. There's a woodshed next to the gate of the yard. Door's always open. When we have our constitutional tomorrow, we hop in there and wait till it's dark. One of the keepers will see us. No, no, there's a new one on. I've been watching him. He's been drunk for a week. Easy as pie. You wait. We did it. Stayed hiding behind the wood till night. I felt funny without the chains on after so long. And then about ten o'clock, we started out of the shed. I took a thick stick from the wood pile. It'll be locked. Have to do a bit of climbing then, eh? All clear. Look, keeper. He's asleep. We have to pass him, supposing he wakes up. He won't. Look, he's waking up. Hurry up now. Give me an hand up first, and then I'll pull you over. Right. All right. Now, now give me your hand. There. Up you go. And there's London. Ain't that the loveliest sight? William Hartley's out there in it. Come on. We stayed together till we was well out of sight of the prison. 
And then Mr. Lovelace said goodbye. I'll leave you here, Price. I can't thank you enough for helping me. We shan't meet again, I suppose. But I'll always remember you. Goodbye. And he went his way. A couple of minutes later, I found a broom maker going home from selling his wares. And after a short argument, I had two silver shillings in my pocket. I tossed for it. William Hartley, now or later? My first one. And that took me to the nearest alehouse in Bunhill Fields. Hardly'd have to wait, but not for long. Oh, I was going to do him a mischief. Pay the little Scott back before the night was out. <laughs> It was two hours later that I left the alehouse with a lovely swishing in my belly and happiness in my head. Funny thing, I couldn't on the life of me remember what I had to do. But there was something. Oh, his groans was dreadful for to hear as the stones they pressed upon him and Jack stood solemn, not shedding a tear when the... Hello's there. It's me, Elizabeth White. Is that you, John Price? I, I thought you were in Marshall Sea. Elizabeth White. Well, I never. What you doing in Bunny Hill Fields this time of night? Well, I had an order of gingerbread to deliver. No. You frightened me. Oh, me, me fright. <laughs> oh, I'm all right. You know that. Well, I've had one or two, but nobody can say John Price can't behave like a gentleman. You are wicked. Uh. Oh, uh, I wish I was married to a sweet woman like you, Elizabeth. Oh, how I envy your husband. Ah, uh, no, no, Mr. Price. Well, I apologise. Humbly. <laughs> Do you hate me? Of course not. I never hated you. It was Harry did want me to talk to you. No, I mean, because I'm Angman. Ah, you're not anymore, anyway. Uh, I'm really very gentle at heart, you know. I'm just misunderstood by one and all. Oh, I suppose. Elizabeth, I've always had a liking for you. Mr. Price. Have you got a little money put away? We could make it a business arrangement, just you and me, huh? And I'll pay you next month, I say. Oh, I haven't got anything, Mr. Price. Hold on, I'll make maybe a shilling or two. You must have cut something for the gingerbread. Please, Mr. Price, my area... Well, it ain't honourable for a man in my position to be in debt. There's no one to turn to. Come on, I'll pay you back. I swear it, I'm desperate. No, no, Mr. Would Price. Would you keep it, huh? Oh, Stop it, you're a watchman down there. Stop it now. Give it away, hear me? No. Oh, ah. oh, you're done. I need this, you see. I need it. I told you I'd pay you. <laughs> Shut it up! Shut it up! Shut it up! Well, here we are again. Newgate this time. The watchman got me. But he was too late for Elizabeth White. I'm afraid I done that in, poor soul. I'm to hang for it, so there you are. I can hear them coming for me now. Go, oh, I'd like a last swig of something to see me on me way. Go, oh, William Hartley. Are you ready, John Price? You nasty little winkle. You mean you're the hangman? I am. God blood. I was coming back to turn you off, you maggoty worm. And I forgot. Or you wouldn't be here now. I bear you no malice, John Price. <laughs> oh, you won't make no hangman. Not for long, you what? You wait. You, you wait. They'll start calling you Jack Catch. You wait. It's my uh, duty. I always knew that someday I'd find my calling to protect the people from such poor wretches as you. I have found it. God blimey. I might have known. I might have known. Blimey, too. Well, I for one haven't got a brass farthing for you. My clothes, <laughs> they won't fetch tuppence. So blast you. I don't want neither. It's me job, John Price. Turning you off is me job. And that's what I'm going to do. You've come to a wicked end, as I knew you would. If I'm going to nab the stifles, and it's William Hartley what's going to do it, 
I'm better off dead. Here, here, William. You, you, you write something for me on the wall, will you? Yeah, yeah, I've got some charcoal. Yeah, right here, here. What? Ah, all right, now you write this. Right, uh, here died John Price, hangman of London. He was turned off upon the gallows, which he had served so well in his day. God save the king in the year 1686. Suspense in which Hans Conried starred in tonight's presentation of The Groom of the Ladder. Be sure to listen in again next week when we bring you another presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. is produced and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis, who also wrote tonight's script. The music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as Hartley. Featured in the cast were Raymond Lawrence, Richard Peel, Bill James, Doris Lloyd, Betty Harford, and Stan Jones. Nobody's selling the Brooklyn Bridge anymore, but don't for a minute think that because that racket has been exposed, a hundred others just as bizarre aren't flourishing right now. Underworld characters who want an easy buck and aren't fussy how they make it are endlessly inventive in that way. Fortunately, the agents of the FBI are even quicker and shrewder in their counter-efforts to foil their plans and ferret them out of hiding. You can hear another startling drama revealing one more of those clever plans and its ultimate defeat on that popular CBS radio program, The FBI in Peace and War, over most of these same stations tomorrow night. Remember, the FBI in peace and war, tomorrow night. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same CBS radio stations by the Jack Carson Show. (laughs) 